Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. Welcome to the Formed Book Club, where we continue to discuss Father Arjun the Box book, The Church, Paradox of Mystery. Mystery. I sort of uh, dominated the conversation last session because I, as an old man, I began uh, recounting memories of my time with the wonderful de Lubac. Uh, I hope not to continue that excessive uh, domination, but I want to make a couple of preliminary remarks. Uh, this book, which is a collection of talks and essays, is called The Church, Paradox and Mystery. And it's basically a commentary on Lumen Gentium. The dogmatic constitution on the church of the Second Vatican Council, which was a really one of the most important texts of the council. I want to just prepare people to be looking for certain things in this book, because after the council and after the approval by the vast majority of the bishops of this document, there were some uh, movements that took place or interpretations took place, which the Lubac is trying to somewhat counteract. One of them is that the prior to the council, back in the 1941, I think it was, Pope Pius XII had issued an encyclical called Mystici Corpus of the Mystical Body of Christ. And there was a great deal of emphasis in the church on the church being the mystical body. Uh, and where was that mystical body to be found? Well, it's, it's present in the visible Catholic Church. Is it present elsewhere? Yes, but there, were, there was controversy on that. At the council, they used many images for the church in the first chapter, but they gave a privilege to one, the people of God. And so what happened after the council is that there was many theologians said, ah, oh, the church has become democratic now. It's not this mystical body, which is hierarchical, it's the people of God. You know, it's all the people together. And so uh, that's not a valid interpretation of the council. And the Lubach wants to explain how that very important expression fits into the rest of the council document. So part of the way he does that is he will show that the people of God, which is the kahal in Hebrew or the ecclesia in yeah. Greek, the gathering together of the people, began as an Old Testament concept brought into the New Testament because we are the inheritors of the revelation and the covenants, you know, to Abraham, but beyond that, Moses and so on. So Delupa spent some time in showing what the relationship is between the Old Testament and the New, that it's not simply a repetition, a carrying on of what was there, it's that, but it's also a, a transformation, a change. And de Lubach is the premier expert on this relationship between Old Testament and New Testament, because he, what he did is he did a huge uh, study which was published in a book called Exegesis Medieval, Medieval Exegesis, where he showed that the, the most important factor in Christian interpretation of the Old Testament was the relationship between the Old and the New. Exactly how did the New Testament relate to the Old? And therefore, how does the new people of God replace relate to the old concept of people of God. So that, that's very important. So number one, we got to be careful looking at what he says about the people of God. Secondly, uh, because Vatican I ended in 1872 or so, I think it was, because of the Franco-Prussian War, it defined the role of the Pope, papal infallibility, and its universal jurisdiction of the church. But it did not get to its discussion of the bishops. In a certain sense, 
Vatican II, because that first council is called Vatican I. Vatican II, well, it's called Vatican Council. And then after Vatican II, it became Vatican I. But uh, the second Vatican Council, accepting Vatican I, completed it by now talking about the bishops and about collegiality. And collegiality is a uh, old term or an old concept that was brought back to the fore in Second Vatican Council. But what happened after the council was this idea that not only is church not democratic, the people of God, but that uh, individual bishops have authority which uh, really cannot be questioned. Uh, they, they, they're, they're part of the college and they're kind of equal with the full primus inter pares, the first among equals. Uh, and so there was a great emphasis on the uh, importance of the what was called the particular church, that is the diocese, or the local church, the region. And the Lubach is very carefully trying to bring that back into balance. Uh, so those are the two things we should be looking for. Oh, one, a third thing is notice how what the book is titled Paradox and Mystery. And those are two very important concepts which he covers in the first two chapters we're discussing now. Paradox includes the idea that you have different ideas that may seem contradictory, but actually come together to show something beyond, something higher. And so he will say and show in the Fathers of the Church and elsewhere that there's many images of the Church. There's bride. There's body, there's institution, there's herald, there's sacrament, there's people of God. Those are not to be set in opposition to each other, but they're meant to be paradoxical approaches to the one reality, which we'll never grasp, and that's called mystery. So the church is paradox, the sort of competing, if you will, but nevertheless complementary version visions of the church, and mystery. The fact that what they point to is something we can never fully grasp. So those are two important things. People of God, well, three points, local church, and then paradox and mystery. And then finally, just a, a footnote to this. Let's keep our eyes as we continue discussing this on the footnotes and the people he uh, cites. Because you'll see that the Lubach is a great portal, so to speak, for us into the great tradition of the church. I mean, he's got Newman and Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and the wonderful people of the church, but many others as well. And so he can help us to see that he is not just speaking on his own behalf. He's already speaking with the voice of, with many voices of the history of the church. So that's my preamble. We ended on page 14. I'd be happy if someone else wants to say anything before I dilate any more on this i have something on page 14 actually so should, should i should i go ahead go ahead Great. well i'm going to begin with a preamble of my own be very brief preamble of my own before i read is that i don't i haven't read the lubeck before now and i've only read the first two chapters thus far so i don't have the the overall overarching understanding and picture of what he's doing and why he's doing it so a i'm grateful for your preamble which has made that clearer to me well it's made made made, made, made me knowledgeable about it have some knowledge of it uh but the, what i so this is also a way of saying that i've highlighted passages that are out of that overarching context so you know that are therefore you know i'm you're you're going to have to contextualize it appropriately when I when I just hit scattershot approach because that's what I've done so that being said uh, just about halfway down page 14 there's something I don't understand so I'm, I'm looking for an explanation um, so he says just as the entire church is contained in the Eucharist which I have no problem with at all as, it's the, as that's the body of Christ, she may also be said to be contained entirely in a saint. Now, as we obviously believe that the saints are, are not divine, um, and that there's a hierarchy indeed of them in heaven, um, I can't see how the, the whole church is contained in a saint. So I, I want explanation, please. That's all. I just don't understand. All right. Well, 
I've also marked that. Let's continue to read it because the next sentence begins with the word for, which is a causal thing. For here is the great wonder, if my eyes could not always perceive it, that is because I did not know how to look. I did not know how to see this beauty most rare, most improbable, most disconcerting, because at first sight so unimaginable to man, like, like you, Joseph, can't imagine it. Uh, it was not the complete achievement of human perfection of which I might have dreamed. So he admits, Joseph, not the Eucharist. This is not the fullest, complete perfection. Nor was it cons consummate wisdom, but a strange and supernatural vista, a uh, strange and supernatural beauty, opening unknown vistas to me, quite bewildering, and at the same time answering to some hitherto hidden call. It was a kind of beauty that even if its radiance had shone through but one human being would have borne witness in favor of its source. In one saint, I saw the whole church pass, anima ecclesiastica. So he, he, he's saying that if you really understand a genuine saint, the mystery, the beauty, of the church is there even even when saints are as all of us sinners and imperfect just as he sees the beauty of the church in its visible representation even though it's made up of sinners so now so i suppose that I, i'm trying to um get my head around the paradox here not the mystery because that would be an impossibility um so you know if i were to see the fact that we are meant to see jesus christ in each other human person and insofar as jesus christ is god therefore in some sense the entirety of the divinity is present in uh the imago dei to whom at whom I'm looking, so I can understand that. I just you know, uh, and I, so I, I, on that level of the paradox, I have no problem with it. I just still think it grates a little bit to me the way it's worded because it sort of makes it seems to put the saint on the same level as the Eucharist, which I well, it's, it's, as we're reading recently in the Gospel of John, that. Uh, he prays that we may be one with him as he is with the Father, that we'll all be one in the Father. And as the Greek fathers insisted again and again, because we have received God in faith and in sacrament, that we have become gods. And it's, it's, uh, I know it's shocking, but the eyes of faith, as they become more accustomed to the light of divinity you know can see that just like as you say just as mother Teresa could see better than we could the face of christ in everyone is even especially the poorest of the poor that how much more does the face of christ radiate in someone who's truly a saint whose life embodies goodness truth and beauty well one way to think about it you mentioning the gospel of john father and jesus also says that he and the Father are going to dwell within us. If we remain in him and he remains in the Father and he and the Father will make their abode in us, which this expression, anima ecclesiastica, spirit of the church, that the spirit of the church, that the spirit of God actually dwells in us. And thinking of the Eucharist, you know, our faith that in every little particle, no matter how small of the Eucharist dwells, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And then we commune with that in order to remain in communion with the vine. We are the branches. He's the vine. You know, I see what he's saying, but I see also that this is, this is a contemplation that he's doing, Joseph, as opposed to trying to hammer down some kind of a specific definition or something. I see him just quite kind of contemplating this mystery. Like, how is it that God dwells in his church? Well, God dwells in his church by dwelling in us. 
And I, the other thing, I, I mean, I, 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 as, as long as we emphasize and accentuate paradox, which Father has done, and as long as we keep to that, it's not a problem. But obviously, yes, uh, I understand fully and agree that we do in some sense, insofar as we're in communion with the mystical body of Christ, become gods. But that's, we have to keep that very different from the sin of pride in which we actually consider ourselves to be God, right? So, um, so th th that distinction, that nuance is necessary, that paradox, uh, you know, has to be understood in, within the context of understanding exactly what we mean by the terms we're using when we use words like God. Well, in this and he doesn't use the word God here. Father added that. He does, on page 11, he, he says that, the, you know, the chief paradox of the church is that the church is at once human and divine, human and divine at the same time. So even though God dwells within us, if we're in communion with him, we don't stop being human, right? Somehow there's both a human reality and a divine reality here. Right, and, but the, the other side of the paradox, which Joseph is alluding to or mentioning here, which is important, uh, is also expressed in this, that the saints aren't the same. Uh, as the Lubach himself once said to me, I think quoting an old proverb, that... Uh, the there's how do you how do you say it? There's no there's no there are no people more like Christ than the saints. There are no people more unlike each other than the saints. Uh, and so, if you can see the whole church in Augustine, and also in a little flower, well, wait a minute, you know how, how does that work? And so, there's a sense in which every saint. And each of us, to the extent we try to be saints or try to live the Christian life, we reflect something different from the divine life incarnate. And even Christ, I mean, he was a Jew of the first century. He was a, had certain color hair. He had a certain size. He had a way he spoke, a language. Well, can you see among saints the same beauty in someone who's speaking Latin and someone who's speaking Greek or someone who's speaking English. Well, yes, you can, but it, it's it's not identical. So that, that's, I, yeah, go ahead. I think another um, meditation that will help us enter this mystery more, because again, remember, we're dealing with mysteries here, um, is when de Lubach talks about Mary and uh, particularly the woman in the apocalypse somehow being both the church and Israel and Mary the woman all at the same time is in that one image of the woman, you know, about to give birth to the child in the clothes of the sun, that somehow that image represents all those things at once, the church, the people of Israel, Mary, and us. And so that's another way of approaching the mystery is through her and all that she represents. Right, and I think in this paragraph below what Joseph mentioned there, what I read was that he's talking about supernatural beauty. And so if you're, if you somehow radiate supernatural beauty, I mean, that is a window onto the divine, which helps you understand that the church is there. But I, I Joseph, I don't disagree with you at all. And I think it's, I mean. No, 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 that's, like I, said, that's, what, that's why I just want to say, as long as we, 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 we're making the, the necessary distinctions about what we mean by the paradox and the relationship between paradox and mystery. So yeah, that, no issue, no issue at, with, with things as explained, right? Not that I might disagree with you if that's necessary, because you know. Uh, it will happen, it will happen. It has happened in the past, it will happen again. Uh, in, in moving forward, I point out just on page 16, the footnote there, that he's, uh, he has a long quote, it's from Hans Ursula Balthus of the glory of the Lord. And part of that mystery which Balthasar expresses in that set of books he has on theological aesthetics is that where do we find the fullest expression of the divine beauty and love and goodness of God, Christ crucified? That, uh, how can you see God 
when you're looking at a cross uh, with a man that's been tortured and is dying and is disfigured, uh, no beauty in him, as Isaiah says. Well, that, that it, really, it takes the eyes of faith to see that. It's, it's beauty demonstrated. There is no greater love than laying down your life for your friends, Jesus says. That's right. right. And so uh, the, that he would go to that degree, that he would go to that length out of love for us. That's why it's beautiful. Like a man throwing himself on a grenade to save his friends, you know? Yeah, that's a horrible yeah, it's, thing it's to look at fact. after it happens, but that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful act. You know, insofar as love is dying to ourselves, then there is uh, something inseparable between love and death. And insofar as that's the case, there's something beautiful in death. I, my that, next comment is on page 20. I have a comment on 17, if Vivian doesn't have something before wow. that. 17 comes before 20. Please go ahead. Okay, well, again, I, I, I really do not want to be taking up the, 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 the position of devil's advocate here, but I, the, 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 there's nothing at all about what Delubac says in the text I have a problem with, but I, I find it incongruous, the footnote. So this is page 17. He says, towards the bottom of the, the text, before the footnote, Without the church, Christ evaporates or crumbles or is erased. And without Christ, what would man be? Well, I have no problem at all with any of that. But then he, he question six, uh, uh, footnote six, he has Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And I have no problem with him quoting Dietrich Bonhoeffer, by the way. I don't want people to assume that I'm, you know, uh, because he's a, a Protestant. But the actual quote, uh, what we want to know is not this or that church have of us but what jesus himself wants of us and again unless i'm misunderstanding something the actual quote from the text is saying that basically the, 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 the church is the church is necessary uh because uh without the church there is no christ and without christ where would we be as men and then we have Dietrich bonhoeffer saying who cares about which church it's about jesus so uh, to me, there's an incongruity there. Unless I'm misunderstanding something again. No, no, no. You, 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 Joseph. That's one of you. You've been drawn into the trap. Uh, you'll call Bonhoeffer here later. On, we'll show you. I mean, he is very subtly, uh, perhaps too subtly. Uh, you're going to use Protestants like Bonhoeffer, who are well respected and rightly so, to demonstrate the truth of the church, because. Just as you said there, he says, quoting Bonhoeffer, what we want to know is not what this or that man or this or that church have with, but what Jesus himself would want of us. And he's going to go on to say, I think it's the next chapter, or is it, no, is that Christ is the mystery. And the church is the mystery because only because it's totally derived from Christ. And so, but the Lubac is basically going to show that the church is Christ. The quote he gives a, but the quote he says from Bonhoeffer there begins with how true the following from the pen of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, colon. And that, and that quote from, ben, from Bonhoeffer seems to me to contradict what the Lubac says himself. No, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's actually true that we want to know not what this or this man or this or that church says, but what Jesus says. But what if one of those Churches is Jesus. Well, then it's kind of paradoxical, but it's, it's not just this or that church. We don't care about that. It's the, the church, which is the one body of Christ, you know. No, I agree with everything you've said. I just I just find that the, the footnote odd uh, in connection with what Max right. says. But no, no. I, I thought it was uh, very uh, cunning. You know, because you get all the Protestant readings. Oh, yeah, well, we agree with Bonhoeffer. That's right. Who cares what this guy or that church, that church says, you know, what Jesus says. Oh, well, what about this, the fact that church is Jesus, you know? Uh -huh. The Catholic Church. So you're, Roman you're, Catholic. Saying is, you're saying he's baiting the hooks, what you're saying. Excuse me? He, he's, he's baiting the hook. He's, That's right. That's exactly right. Yes, and, you yes. took, and you took it. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, we go. I'm, I'm, I'm gullible. Have you been anything before page 20? Not, not necessarily. Please go. 
Not necessarily, but what about contingently or, you know? Well, because, I mean, I underline so many things. Just you go, Father, you have well, something. Well, I, I, I just, but why should my underlines preempt your underlines? I mean, speak if you'd like to speak. No, that's all right. Okay. okay. Top of the page. It happens that men, blindly forgetting all that they, have, they owe to her, abandon this holy church. It happens too, as we see today, that she's insulted by those she still nourishes. So, folks got kind of counseling in our own time. You know, those who call themselves Catholic who are insulting the church. Uh, a wind of sweeping, mindless, bitter criticism comes at times to turn heads and alienate affections. I'm thinking right now, as we do this recording, of the controversy in the public here in the United States because our wonderful Archbishop Corleone has said that Nancy Pelosi, who calls herself a devout Catholic, cannot receive communion because she's violating the teachings. Of, and what does she do? Come up? She comes out and insults him and the church. And Whoopi Goldberg, who is that guy? What is that? No, dude. What does that dude have to do about this? That's not his job. Hey, Whoopi, I'm not sure where you figured this your theology up, but he is a pastor of the church. Nancy Pelosi is in his archdiocese. That's her date residence. That's why she's a congresswoman from San Francisco. Anyway, so a wind of sweeping, mindless, bitter criticism comes at times to turn heads and alien infections. It is a drying, sterilizing wind, a destructive wind, hostile to the breath of the spirit. It is then Conquering my mother's humil humiliated face, that I will love her twice as much. Yes, little Mark. Without trading polemic for polemic, I show her that I love her even in her guise of slave. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, de Lubach is not in any way naive about the realities of being a Christian inside the church, or is he naive about the harsh criticism that comes from those outside the church? And yet he always exercises such restraint and charity the way he goes about constructing his arguments. Yes, he does. And, he does. and this is right before he talks about Today, she, meaning the church, demands, as she has rarely done before, a massive effort from all of us, an effort corresponding to the needs of an age of change. He goes on, openness and renewal. These keywords sum up the whole program of this effort. And then he's very careful to define what he means by openness and renewal, because as we know, there are people who take those words and run with it to simply impose their own agenda assuming that theirs is the renewal and theirs is the openness. He's very careful to, uh, in fact, he goes straight to Newman, whom, whom better to choose than Newman to talk about openness and renewal, you know? And also, but then, but then you know, for me, the punchline, literally, because it packs punch, is the final sentence of that very paragraph. May I always understand that only my attachment to the church's tradition which is not a burden, but a strength, will be the principle of all effective audacity. Now, I mean, that would be the antidote to anybody who tries to take what the Lubeck says and run with it in an heretical direction. Right. So we are pretty much at the end of this first chapter from Paradox to Mystery. Any final comments on that? I think we can probably close our session with that chapter. Well, I do love this line from that he quotes from Augustine on page 21. We receive the spirit of God if we love the church. <laughs> Very good. Mm -hmm. without, without the love of God, the spirit of God is not there. Amen. Amen. That's good. Um, Oh. Father, just just before we finish, um, so um, are we? Because we, we we told people to read chapters one and two. Uh, are we are we going to just have chapter two, or do we think we can be 
Well, we'll let, let, let's try to keep at least one chapter. And chapter three is a longer chapter, but let's at least part of it. Yes. Right. You're correct. Yeah, yeah, right. So just chapter two for next week then, yes? Right. Well, possibly part of chapter three. Possibly. Who knows? I may, you know, gag or something, you know. So if people want to be ultra cautious and ultra responsible, they can read chapter three as well, but we probably won't get very far into it. Very good. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching or listening. See you next week. God bless you. If you enjoyed this discussion, please help spread the word about the Forum Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.